it seemed like oh, what's wrong with me that there's something wrong with me why why am i not like other people why am i the one who always wants to keep doing this and doing that and you know why isn't one thing enough <laughs> you know yeah. so it's like, and at some point i had to realize that you know what there's nothing wrong with me no you know the reason I um, I keep wanting to do all these other things is because I'm supposed to be doing them. That's the way God made me, you know. And I and I need to express myself fully. Is that I'm a part time doctor and a full time everything else. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel, or welcome to the channel if you're new here. We have a very long awaited guest. This guest I have had wanted to have her on since I met her. She has such an intriguing journey. It combines dentistry, medicine, addiction medicine, being an author, photography, being a musician, <laughs> so many amazing things. So welcome to the channel, Dr. Peju Samoyan. Thank you, Jillian. Doctor. <laughs> Right, good. So nice to be on your show at last. We've been talking about this for like, seems like forever now, right? I know, yes. And of course, <laughs> please call me Jillian or Jill, either one works. Okay. I'd love for you to share your story with the audience. Okay, thank you. Um, depends on how much time we have. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have all the time in the world, so please feel free to share it as much as you'd like. Okay, but your audience probably doesn't have all the time in the world. You know so let's they, see. Should, they should make time for it. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so right now, let's start from where I'm right now, what I'm doing right now, and then maybe we can work backwards a little bit. Yeah. So um, so I'm an addiction medicine physician in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and right now, I'm only working as a doctor on a very part-time basis. I'm the medical director at a, a local methadone clinic. And like I said, it's a very part-time position. Uh, right prior to that, I uh, actually the position that brought me to the Reading area was um, as the uh, medical director and then executive director of research at an addiction treatment facility. Yeah. <laughs> and prior to that, I was program director of the addiction medicine um, fellowship at Geisinger. So that was in the Scranton, Pennsylvania area. So. Uh, Prior to being the program director there, I had been um, working in different facilities. But what took me to Scranton right after residency was um, a job with what was then a brand new medical school, uh, then known as the Commonwealth Medical College. And now it's the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. So it's in 2017, it became part of Geisinger. So I had right out of residency, I had gone uh, there to be part of the founding faculty. So that was an interesting experience being part of a brand new medical school. And it's, in fact, I, I just got back from Scranton. I was there this weekend. So it wow. was nice to, yeah, to be able to go back and visit again. And, um, and so much has changed <laughs> since then, you know, and the school has really grown, but yeah, so that was really an interesting experience. And um, to talk about how I got into addiction medicine. So I was right out, out of my family medicine residency. And so in residency, that's another long story. I had left a combined family family medicine and psychiatry program. And I hadn't really done very much psychiatry, much as I, I liked mental health. And, um, but I, for a number of reasons, I just, uh, it didn't feel right to continue in that program and stay, stay on. So I, I, and I knew at that time that I was interested in addiction medicine and I knew I didn't have to be a psychiatrist to do addiction medicine. So I went back to Penn State where I had trained for medical school and then finished the last two years of my residency. So finished family medicine and, um, and then went to this new medical school, um, initially thinking that they were going to have a faculty practice as, you know, as they grew and that I would be able to practice there. And well, if anybody has ever been at a new medical school, there are a lot of things that they have to deal with, especially when it was considering it was an independent school at that time. It wasn't part of a university or a health system. So there were a lot of problems and starting a faculty practice wasn't their priority <laughs> as I could yeah. be discovered. Hmm. Yeah. So I ended up, uh, because I wanted to stay clinically active, I mean, the other several of, the, there weren't that many clinicians who were on the full-time faculty, right? And then the others were mostly people like, um, people like my department chair or the dean at the time who 
had practiced for years and it didn't really matter if they never saw a patient again. And I knew that I wasn't in that position. So I had to proactively look for ways to keep clinically active. And, and that's how come I um, ended up, well, one of the opportunities that came up was that uh, a company was starting a methadone clinic locally, just outside of Scranton, and they were looking for a medical director. And one of the local psychiatrists knew of my interest. And so he, uh, he connected me with them. And then, so I ended up <laughs> becoming the medical director of a methadone clinic. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. I'm liking this. I'm liking this. I'm liking this flow. It's like responding to the flow of how things are going, have the vision of what you're looking for, knowing mm -hmm. it's not where you're at, and then allowing yourself to be open about what you're seeking so that I think it's wonderful that somebody connects you and just thinks of you like if you hadn't voiced what you were looking yes. for, that person wouldn't have known. Exactly. Exactly. And had exactly. you felt like how easy it is it us for us to think, I committed to this medical school. Now I have to stay and make it work and sacrifice mm -hmm. patient care. But you were mm -hmm. the of, I'm not ready to do it. That's not the time of my life. And mm -hmm. I need to look for alternative options. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, and we were able to make it work. I stayed on faculty, but I was clinically active, you know, so um, a couple of days a week, I would see patients, but I was still very, very involved in various aspects of the medical school, the curriculum, their, you know, community activities. I was I, doing a lot, a lot of different things. Yeah, it sounds but, good. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's how I got into addiction medicine. So, and then, and then I worked, uh, uh, besides, after the methadone clinic, I also worked in a couple of other addiction treatment facilities in the general area. And then and then got board certified in addiction medicine. And then uh, my last couple of years uh, in, that, in the Geisinger system, I was now asked to be the program director for the, for the fellowship, for the addiction medicine fellowship. And uh, so that's what I did before I, before I moved to where I am right now for yet another position. So, but then how did I get there in the first place? So, so yeah, we talked I wanna, about- <laughs> I wanna ask you one question before you go backwards. Sure. What made you interested in addiction medicine? That's a good question. And, and yeah. in the past, people would ask me that question and I couldn't really answer. And I'm still not sure I have an answer because, okay, a lot of people go into addiction medicine because they have either personal experience with it or family, you know, family members have been affected and that sort of thing. And I didn't have that kind of story. So for me, um, I have to say, though, that, you know, I said I did very little psychiatry. But I was in a combined program, but I'd only done a few months of actual psychiatry rotations. But most of that time was spent in addiction psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that that's where I got the initial interest from. But I think that that kind of solidified it. And because wow. I saw that I just had this feeling, this is something that I could do. You know, this is something that I could really see myself doing. And um, but I think I had that interest from before, and it was not that long ago that I, I remember just thinking back to how one thing had led to the other, to the other, to the other. So, so I had started out as a dentist. <laughs> right. All right. Funny story. So, Why would you ever consider that option <laughs> from your fellow <laughs> dentist friend? <laughs> exactly. Why would just I in ever case become audience wants to like they think that I'm yeah. being mean to my guests? No, we we share no, that, we that share, attribute. <laughs> share common interest. Yeah. So, so I had, um, after being born in Washington, DC, because my father was a diplomat serving in Washington, DC at the time of my birth, I actually grew up in Nigeria. So, and it's the system there was more closely aligned with the British system. So, uh, you didn't have to do four years of college before going to medical or dental school or whatever. And looking back now, I feel like we were forced to make lifetime decisions way too early. Yeah, And on, on top of that, I was also kind of like younger than a lot of my classmates. So I finished high school at 15. Wow. Literally. And literally six years later, I was a dentist. Wow. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like um, I went in thinking that, oh, this is what I want to do with my life and everything. Uh, my parents were pushing me to be a doctor because that's what respectable Nigerian children do. If you're <laughs> a doctor or a lawyer, engineer, architect. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So they were pushing me in that direction. And there's a part of me that knew, a part of me wanted to be a doctor, but I also knew that I had other interests. Mm. You know, um, I knew I had a lot of other interests and I felt that um, being a doctor, I might not have time to pursue all these other things. And just all these 
I was thinking too much, I think. So <laughs> I think I was, th we are of the same, I think we're soul sisters in some capacities. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate all of this so far and leaning in and, and allowing, right? It's allowing mm -hmm. yourself to lean mm -hmm. into your interests and develop it as it unfolds. Exactly. So here I was, you know, basically a teenager, you know, not really knowing that I, you know, I wanted to help people. I wanted to quote unquote, save the world, but I wanted to do all these other things too. So, so I thought, you know, well, dentistry, I knew that dental and medical students were pretty much in school together there, you know, for the first couple of years, it was pretty much the same curriculum for the most part. So I, you know, I was like, well, if I do dentistry, I'll, you know, learn, you know, about the body, learn about, you know, the anatomy, physiology and things that I'm interested in, you know, and then, but then I'll end up having a career that will allow me to do other things. That's kind yeah. of what I was thinking. You know, and people, then you think that about dentistry, right? They yeah. they often that's something that comes up when people are deciding between dentistry and medicine. Uh, and yeah. it's something that now I you know you can create as you have, and many of our physician colleagues have created life outside of medicine. It's necessary, exactly. especially in this day and age where healthcare is a mess. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, so I ended up, you know, doing dentistry then so right out of high school. So Six years after high school, I was twenty. I was a twenty-one-year-old dentist, and um, and then we had to do a year of youth service, and then, and then, um, no, 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 a year of like an internship, an internship, and then a year of youth service, and then I had to did a residency as well in pediatric dentistry. But I kept again wanting to do more, kept wanting to do more, and um, I guess a part of me knew that I had this interest in public health without really understanding much about public health but i just yeah. i knew i had this interest in public health yeah. and i had been told i had heard that you know if you get an mph from johns hopkins there's a job waiting for you you know um uh, so i was like yeah okay maybe i'll go to hopkins and get my mph and um, go save the world by working for who or unicef or you know some big <laughs> big international organization and so I found my way to Johns Hopkins got my NPH and uh there was no wonderful job waiting for me at the end of that <laughs> isn't that interesting and what do you make of that like once you achieved your NPH what do you think the gaps were between this vision that people painted and the reality that's a tough question I think that um I don't know the impression I had to be very honest the impression I had was that because I had a dental background at the time and not a medical background, I felt that people saw me uh, saw me as a dentist and felt that I didn't have necessarily the background they were looking for. I don't know if that's true, but that that was the impression that I had. Interesting. It's a, just a belief I have in many different regards. So <laughs> it's interesting to hear it come out of your mouth. Someone as well. else? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. So, so, but because I had the dental background, I was able to get into a, a dental public health residency. Mm. So, uh, so I did, I went to Montefiore Medical Center in New York and did that residency. And I'm going to tie this all, if I can, to addiction, yeah. <laughs> how I got the interest in addiction I'll, medicine. Well, yeah, I will share with you that yeah. I got into addiction, I got into opioids um, because mm -hmm. of dentistry, got into reducing opioid use and prescription mm -hmm. for mm -hmm dental related complaints in the emergency room mm -hmm. the love of my life was had some issues with benzos and opioids mm -hmm. and I okay. saw that and uh mm -hmm. I, I come from uh, I lost an uncle early who had some addiction issues Sorry. And, but you just know how quickly it can take hold of somebody exactly. and, mm -hmm. and so that's why I was curious to know how you got interested in and it okay. made sense for me coming from a dental background because we are <laughs> you know we were the top prescribers exactly. of opioids for so long Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know the actual statistics, but we, we prescribed them pretty freely when I was mm -hmm. in dental school. And I, I started dental school, I think at 21 or right after mm -hmm. that. So I know, and I decided at 18. So when you're saying how early I'm like, yeah, we decided, you decided even earlier than me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. fascinating. Okay. So please. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> and I think it all ties in, but for the audience, yeah, I may yeah. not see the threads yet. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. keep going <laughs> Yeah. So, so, uh, so back to actually, so during the MPH year, we had to do this thing called an integrating experience. It's kind of like a, I guess it was the capstone project, but they didn't call it capstone then, at least not at Hopkins. Um, so it was called the integrating experience. Mm -hmm. And I had initially wanted to do something um, that would have involved collecting data from Nigeria and all of that. And it was a one-year program, actually 11 months. So 
it, that wasn't really practical. So I ended up doing something that was more practical and just basically writing a paper on um, oral cancer prevention and the role of the dentist or something along those, yeah, the role of the dentist in preventing oral cancer, you know, and so tobacco, alcohol, all right. And then and, and at the time I wrote the paper, you know, and uh, graduated and everything, I, I didn't necessarily think it was something I would carry with me or, you know, take any further. But then when I was at Montefiore for my dental public health residency, I, um, I had to do a project and then I had tried to do other projects and things weren't working out. And then towards the end of the year, it was supposed to be a one year program. Towards the end of the year, I came up with this idea of something that was actually doable, but, but the year was almost over. So I stayed on another year and did a survey on tobacco cessation activities among dentists in New York state. And that actually got published in the, in the New York state dental journal. But, um, I remember, and this is back to the interest in addiction, you know, the question kept coming up, you know, why do people find it so hard to stop smoking? You know, and I remember I would say, because it's an addiction. <laughs> it's an yeah. addiction, you know? So I, I think some seeds might have been sown there, you know, even, and again, I have a general interest in behavioral medicine anyway, um, but I think that the whole, the idea of, you know, addictions and everything the seeds were being sown gradually. So here I did the, the paper during my MPH on oral cancer prevention and the role of the dentist. And, but that was just like, you know, a literature search, a literature review, and then writing a paper. And then now I actually did a survey where I sent surveys out to dentists all over the state of New York um, and then wrote that up. And so I think somehow or other those kind of, uh, those activities and experiences kind of like laid the foundation for, um, yeah, for that interest. And, and again, I had, um, when I was going to medical school, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't even thinking of psychiatry. I wasn't thinking of addiction medicine. <laughs> so, but somehow or other, it all, it all came together. And um, yeah, and I ended up, you know, doing the family medicine resident, going to Penn State for medical school after, <laughs> after being in New York for four years, right? So I stayed with Montefiore a total of four years. And at some point it was like, okay, uh, this could have been four years of medical school, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and I still kept wanting to do more and, and kept wanting to do more and feeling like I needed, you know, more training and I really wanted to be able to have a greater impact. And so at some point I was like, you know, just do it. <laughs> so, I, so I, I love I this, love so, this much. so much. Uh, as uh, you know, I am applying to psychiatry next year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Finally, and part of the honoring that is stories like this, where you meet people who have navigated and they keep trying and they keep searching. And there's this, you know, whether it's this desire to keep learning or this internal, like, okay, that void wasn't yet filled. I'm not <laughs> quite in it yet. Right. It's like, it's just not, I just didn't hit it yet and keep yeah. working to find what you're trying to create and how often people feel trapped and you're, showcasing how important it is to just allow yourself to explore because mm -hmm. I, found, mm -hmm. I started off as a fast tracked into oral maxillofacial surgery mm -hmm. and once I got into med school I was like I love all of medicine more than mm -hmm. I do surgery and I wouldn't have known that had I not taken that mm -hmm. first step so everything that you're saying and man, it's interesting because you started so young, you've accomplished so many things. And like, how are you not in the grave, right? Like, it's just, <laughs> it sounds like you should be so much older. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, oh my God, it's just such a lifetime. And every imprint you've had to every patient that you've impacted and every time you share your story as a speaker, as an author, you know, as a musician, you share your music as a as a physician, as a, you know, somebody that has a dental background, I'm like, oh my gosh, my mind is blown at the amount of people that you've touched through your life. So when you think about changing the world, like that is changing the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I really appreciate that because I know it, it means a lot to me to hear you say that. And I, and I really, really mean that because for the longest time, it seemed like oh, what's wrong with me, that there's something wrong with me. Why, why am I not like other people. Why am I the one who always wants to keep doing this and doing that? And you know, why isn't one thing enough? For me? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's like, and at some point, I had to realize that you know what? There's nothing wrong with me. No. You know, 
the reason I um, I keep wanting to do all these other things is because I'm supposed to be doing them. That's the way God made me, you know, and I, and I need to express myself fully. And like you said, and that's how I impact the world, not by trying to lock myself into a, into a pigeonhole, you, you know, trying to be like other people. For the longest time, I kept thinking that, oh, I need to, you know, you know, it's okay to have role models, but, you know, <laughs> your role models are role models who are living their own lives. You need to <laughs> learn what you can from them, but live your own life, you know? And it took me a long time to get to that point where I was just, where I learned to just be comfortable with being myself, you know? And, and then I would have people wanting to talk to me, wanting to get advice from me, wanting me to talk to their children, wanting, you know, and it's like, oh my goodness, why did I think there was something wrong with me? If everybody's, if, if, if all these people are now looking to me, <laughs> Mm -hmm. so looking to me for guidance or looking to me to help give their children guidance, then I must be doing something right. Why, why was I so, you know, why was I so, con um, yeah, why did I think that there was something wrong with me? <laughs> yeah, well, the system wants you to have a very linear path in medicine. Exactly, it doesn't want exactly. you to pivot because then it doesn't show that you're committed according to the feedback mm -hmm. we get. Mm -hmm, and I've mm -hmm. just had this conversation over because as you know me a little, I'm on an expert, I'm kind of exploring what it means to be myself again. And I'm like, the picture of the person that I want to be is that person that's free and expansive and flows and mm -hmm. just shows up their creative, authentic self. That's you. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yes. Oh, so I love it. And I love that people are acknowledging that and they're you know they're showcasing there's something about her that she's just really leaning in and living in a way that I think when we get stuck on that linear path or we mm -hmm. create these limitations on ourselves, then it really minimizes just our ability to lean in to new opportunities to new adventures and to seeking other ways that we can help and I found that you know when it comes to our identity like I am a person who and if you describe kind of that likes to help people well you don't mm -hmm. have to attach that to a job title right it exactly be exactly yeah there's a lot it, of different ways you can do that yeah and speaking of job titles i i realized it took me a long time to get to the point where i realized that there was no job there was no one job yeah that was going to allow me to be you know everything i was supposed to be and so you know it just it, it wasn't it just wasn't going to happen there's no can you imagine uh, um the dean of a medical school saying you know Oh, you know, I like, okay, you, we want to employ you to be the addiction medicine specialist, you know, and to do all this curricular work, you know, and we know that you like photography, so we're going to give you time to do your photography. And we know that you like music as well. So we're going to give you time yeah. <laughs> to pursue music. That's not going to happen. You have to create your own life. You, you yeah. know, we all have to do that. And that's something that I realized that I have to, you know, I've had to do, you know, and and also just realizing that I don't have to work full time. That was, that was another very, very liberating. Mm. It is also fascinating. Discovery. Yeah. Cause part-time medicine is still like a lot more, more hours oftentimes than full-time. And I, I found that um, even, so I left the clinic in 2021. Like I don't see patients mm -hmm. primarily. I'll go mm -hmm. in with my boss occasionally, but that mm -hmm. was the hardest thing for me as, cause I have identified as a clinician. Yes, like, I yes. want to be a, yeah, I want to be a clinician, but not in that I needed a break from dentistry, but it was such a really hard shift for me because often in medicine, we see one, our worth is like our clinical presence and revenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then also uh, coming from a former surgical background into a less surgical career. And mm -hmm. then, so during COVID, I was a hospital-based dentist teaching dentists in the hospital. It's like, not where you thrive when COVID hits. And mm -hmm. when I took a step out of that, I'm like, that's what I need. I need a break from this situation, but it was <clears> hard <throat> to give myself permission. And so when mm -hmm. you were saying in the beginning, you're working part-time to give other people the permission so that you can have a full-time life, right? So that you can have exactly. a full life. Because if I worked full-time, my life would be part-time or my life would be exactly not as full. It yeah, it's it's interesting that you said that because what I've been telling people lately is that I'm a part time doctor and a full time everything else. <laughs> oh, I love that! I love it. Yeah, that's the picture you painted. I captured it well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you know, and and sometimes it's you know sometimes life throws us these curveballs that force us to pivot because 
it wasn't like I, um, it wasn't like I made a decision to, it wasn't like I had planned to leave my job at the time I did. It was circumstances that led to my leaving full-time employment. You know, at the time I hadn't really planned on doing so, but, but looking back, it was the best decision. It was the best thing, you know? So again, sometimes life circumstances just happen and they, they just force you to do what you're really supposed to be doing anyway. Yeah. So I, 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 I walked away, I walked away from certainty into uncertainty and I, Went and started recording Christmas music. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And my CD that was starting a year ago. And uh, initially, I wanted to release the whole thing last year, but and most of it was done within the first few months. But we decided not to. So, but but the whole CD is now done. We released one song last year before Christmas, and then now the full CD, thirteen songs, has just been uh, released. Yes, and then I started uh, publishing. I had published two photo books before. Uh, again, I loved writing, loved photography, uh, but years ago, didn't really have a whole lot of time to write. So I figured if I combine my writing and my photography, I can start putting out books that don't have a lot of text, right? But, you know, and that aren't that hard, that don't take yeah. that, that much time to, to finish, you know? And I started, um, yeah, publishing books with my writing and my photography. And then I, um, so last year when I, uh, when I left the job, there was one particular book, um, a, a devotional with Proverbs daily reflections for you know, each day of the month. And um, I had been working on that for years on and off. And then finally, but it was almost done. It was almost done even before I left uh, my place of employment. But I got it done, got it out there and uh, got it published on Amazon. And I actually worked with a coach. So sometimes working with a coach can be very helpful can really make a, dis, a difference because she really, yeah, 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 because she really, she showed me how I had self-published before, but I had never put books on Amazon. I had, there were so many, you know, different things that she, you know, she helped me with. And, you know, so coaching was a, a, a great decision because that first book, uh, Living Foolproof, got published, and then I was just on a roll. So this year, I, I, republished two of my earlier books, uh, one Scranton, A Place to Call Home, uh, and then the one on butterflies. And then I have a workbook um, that is, it has, it goes through the stages of change in behavioral health, behavioral medicine, and compares them with the stages of the butterflies life cycle. So that's for use in clinical settings, you know, people struggling with addictions or eating disorders or other behavioral disorders. Uh, so it's a little workbook, you know, but again, it has some of my pictures of, you know, butterflies at different stages of development and then case studies uh, about people uh, true to life. I mean, they weren't real patients, but true to life uh, case studies and then questions for reflection and all of that. And then um, and then I have this fascination with wildlife. I, I don't have pets. I'm not into indoor pets, but I really, really love wildlife. Mm. And I have um, been learning a lot about animals and thinking about how can I put, um, how can I put some of what I'm learning into books again with my, <laughs> with my photography, with my wildlife photography. And uh, as I was thinking and about how I would organize the information and I, I just thought, you know, I learned so much about giraffes. I was like, you know, giraffes are so amazing. They deserve their own book. <laughs> so, so I published a book on giraffes, but it has pictures of giraffes, but it also has a lot of um, information and, and, do you know that giraffes, as long as their necks are, their necks can be six feet long. Um, they have the same number of cervical vertebrae that we do. Oh, only seven. Yes, wow. only seven. Yeah. They have all these adaptations with their circulatory system so that they don't, you know, the, like when they bend, the, the blood doesn't rush to their brains. And, and when they lift their heads up so that um, they don't get lightheaded. Yeah. Um, the, the, the people who designed the spacesuits for the astronauts got inspiration from studying the giraffe. I mean, it's just so amazing. There's just so much you can learn. And um, I'd love to write books about other animals too, but the giraffe book is on Amazon now with, with my other books too. So it's like, I've just been on a roll. I'm working on a women in medicine book, which you are in by the way. <laughs> Yay. Yes. Which is such yes. an honor. It really means the world to me. So thank you for that opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. Very, very deserving. Yeah. And so, um, and hopefully I'm hoping that uh, that will be published next year. And I, I, I really hope that it will really inspire people that, um, so the hope is that, is that young girls, young people um, 
people will read, not even just girls, but I, I want to particularly inspire girls, but not just girls, but people will read the book and read these stories about these amazing women who became doctors, but were also much more. So whether it was that they were, um, they became a physician, but they were also still a musician or, or you know, uh, a writer or, you know, and then leaders in medical education as well, just showcasing different people from different walks of life, women physicians, uh, different specialties, um, different parts of the world. And uh, so I really want to inspire people and, and, you know, and show the world that yes, girls can become doctors, but we can also be much more. <laughs> I am. Yeah. You're very inspirational. So we can find Thank your books you. on Amazon and where's the Christmas music? Where can we find that? So, so, <laughs> so the CD just came out. I, I, people would have to either con contact me directly to get the CD itself. Or um, if you're in the Reading area, which most of your listeners probably aren't in Reading, Pennsylvania, there's a, uh, I have some of them in a store called um, From the Heart Consignment. Oh, nice. um, yeah, but people can contact me directly. And then the, um, they'll be available for digital download on um, Spotify and iTunes soon. But, but it's, not, it's not, um, not just yet. Yeah, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully before Christmas, the, the, the song should all be available for digital download wherever you listen to your, um, to your podcast or your music. I think this is so lovely. And I've seen you bring your books around the world. Can you share your adventures, please? Oh, oh, thank you. You know, the whole thing about the book. So um, this summer I traveled to Europe, but I don't think, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get, I didn't have the idea then. So I went to Europe to visit family in the UK and then I attended weddings in Malaga, Spain and Poland. So that was yeah, very interesting trip. For some reason, I uh, it didn't occur to me. I did have I did have some of my books then, but it didn't occur to me to make those videos. But I'm also um, the editor of a literary journal with Reading Hospital called Silver Linings, and this is something I I did at Geisinger. We had um, Geisinger's Medical School. We had Black Diamonds then, and in medical school we had at Penn State Hershey we had um, it was called uh, Wild Onions. So anyway, so when I was um, I got the opportunity to go to Cairo. <laughs> this October, right? And then while I was there, I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to do some videos? Oh, actually before Cairo, sorry, I started talking about Silver Linings, the journal, and, and I'm the editor. So I was just, you know, <clears throat> promoting it. And then at some point I would just, you know, be in front of a building, maybe the Reading Public Museum. And then I'll just shoot a quick video. I'm here in front of the museum, you know, get a copy of Silver Linings. You know, as I started doing that, you know, just in different places, you know, and then, so when I was in Cairo for this uh, seminar on women in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, I started recording videos with silver linings, but also with my own books. And it was so much fun. So I just kept doing it. You I know? love them. I love them. It really catches my attention. It reminds me of the flat Stanley. Did you ever have a flat Stanley? No. Okay. Well, flat Stanley is this flat person that you bring on trips with you and you okay. take a photo and it's if I'm recalling correctly it's like you share with other people and it's the flat Stanley so like if I were to have if I want you to come on a trip with me but you can't I might okay. take a photo of you and bring it everywhere oh. and then it feels like you're with me okay oh, right? interesting yeah so um so it was endearing to me and as you know because i commented on it during a physician entrepreneur group talking about marketing i'm like you should see Peju. she's so last got awesome way to showcase her books on all of these different areas i'm like wow she's next to the pyramids with her book <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm glad I actually thought about that because I, you know, it's not something that I anticipated that like I had pre-planned or anything, you know, but once I started doing it, you know, and then like there was one well, with me in front of a camel, I wasn't on the camel, but I was, you know, in front of a camel and I had my giraffe book, you know, and then, you know, and I had the opportunity to say something about how, you know, what do giraffes and camels have in common, you know, just things like that, you know? Yeah. Yes. And, um, yeah. And uh, let's see, you know, and then the one about, uh, I did a couple in front of the Nile River, you know, and with my scrants in a place to call home, you know, some people call, um, call 
Cairo home, you know. I called Scranton home for 10 years, you know. Even if you can't try, um, um, where do you call home? If, if you can't travel, you can learn about other places by reading a book, you yeah. know. So, and these things, it's not like they're scripted. I, <laughs> I kind of come up with them on the spur of the moment. And sometimes I have to like, you know, do a couple takes <laughs> for it yeah. to make sense for me to be comfortable putting it out there but yeah but it's it's just it's been a lot of fun I, I really really enjoy doing those you know and and because I was anticipating the Christmas CD uh, while I was in Cairo even though it wasn't done I actually recorded one um in a it was a perfume store and they were showing me all these different kinds of perfume and scents and and then they they actually had frankincense and myrrh <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, okay. I could talk about Christmas, you know, the first Christmas gifts, you know, and then, so there's this video, which you'll probably see eventually about, you know, I'm here. I have a bottle of myrrh, a bottle of frankincense. I wish I could tell you I had a stash of gold, yeah. <laughs> but I don't, but I do have music. When I get, that yeah, is so, so was, awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what it brings up, you know, with the severity of burnout people are facing a lot of mm -hmm. times, we don't realize the importance of play and creativity. And exactly, when you're in, exactly. like, when you're in survival mode, I, mm -hmm. you know, it's really hard to allow yourself to get into that creative mind, but if you mm -hmm. can't allow yourself to play and be creative, it's actually, mm -hmm can help prevent and oh, definitely symptoms of burnout. And I definitely. know burnout is kind of an often overused term. I think sometimes mm -hmm. we use burnout to describe emotional exhaustion, moral injury, symptoms of PTSD, yeah. depression, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. all of those things that might be contributing to somebody not feeling well. And um, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I love like, you're just, you just speak life. It's just so, Thank you. my whole soul right now is just, I can see all these colors. I have so much hope and optimism Aww, through listening to your story. Oh, like, thank you. I'm glad to yeah, that. you're modeling so many wonderful things, right? You're just leaning into things that you're like, I redid that a few times. It's, <laughs> you know, whatever. You're just leaning into your creative self and rolling with it. And it's <laughs> beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it really means a lot to me to hear that. Um, but I, I, I think you're so right. We really just um, we we have to we have to make space and time for creativity. We have to do things that feed our souls. And it's nice to know that while I'm doing things that feed my soul, I'm hopefully helping other people to feed their souls too and lifting them up. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I, I just think that that's so important. <laughs> Uh, you are definitely doing that. I mean, I speak for my own reaction to all of your posts and how it fills me up in this conversation. And mm -hmm. there's no doubt in my mind that you're achieving that mission. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I... <laughs> Before we dive into dentistry and physician things and combining those two from oh, this yeah. stage of our conversation, what are the main takeaways you want people to grab from this part of our conversation? This part. So I want people to um, just remember that you are a unique individual, right? So um, I've said this a couple of times before, uh, and I hope it comes out right, but stop trying to be normal, whatever normal is. Yeah. It's just, just, just be the superstar that you were created to be. And it's taken me a long time to come to that realization. In fact, I, th I think I'm still working on it. You know, so I'm preaching to myself as well. <laughs> we, I have this discussion every time. It's like we, we write the messages we need to hear. We write the books we need to read. We share the messages we need to hear. Because, you know, we had to, there had to be a process of learning it that we exactly. devoted ourselves to. Exactly. I, I do find that life is this, you know, this finding ourselves, creating mm -hmm. ourselves is a lifelong mm -hmm. process that evolves it over is. time. It and is. I also love, even just, you no know, Gabor Mate uh, has this huge book, The Myth of Normal, which is see big books. So I haven't read it all, but even just the title, The Myth yeah. of mm -hmm. Normal. And to think, so when I was a surgical resident and developed depression, I was like, oh my God, I'm such a failure as if no one else was struggling. It was like exactly. very real. Yeah, these were very real thoughts. I'm like, I am, I looked around and no one talked about it was the issue. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh so. yeah, 
Yeah, we could have a whole other conversation about that. There, there are so many things that I struggled with, you know, imposter syndrome. I remember hearing about imposter syndrome as a thing and it was like, oh, other people have that. Well, it probably really is imposter syndrome for, for them. But but in my case, it probably, you know, I, I probably really am not really that good. And that's why I feel this way. You know what I mean? I <laughs> do know what you mean. I do. Yes. The same stuff here. The same stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, you definitely speak to my reality as well. So I'm sure we're not alone. So yeah. thank you so much for this lively and lovely discussion. Where can people find you? You're very welcome. It's been so nice uh, to be here and have this lively discussion. <laughs> so I think the easiest place is um, uh, my website. It's called the doctor, the doctor writer all one word, uh, lowercase, thedoctorwriter.com. And that can be contacted uh, through, there's a contact me um, tab there. Um, so people can send messages, you know, I'm, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook, but the, the website is the easiest place, thedoctorwriter.com. Awesome. And then my, well, well, we'll share links with my Amazon author page and stuff like yes. that later on. Okay, yes. <laughs> We're going to put those links down below. And when your music comes out on Spotify, we're going to put that you. down below. Put your website down below. And I hope they do reach out to you and include any other additional comments or questions down below because we interact a lot. So I'm sure we could have a part yeah. two, three, four, whatever sure. comes out. I'm sure we along could. The way. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. And my thank pleasure. You Thank you to our audience for being here. I hope they've been inspired and encouraged and you gave them so many different types of questions that they can ask. I just want to hear from the peoples. Yeah, I'd love to hear their questions too. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really yeah. been a pleasure. And